Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the art of the interview. Thank you for joining us in what we consider to be a very important and perennial topic. I'm Janessa Duncombe. I'll be your host this evening. And I'm joined by Frank Cessno, the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the George Washington University's School of Media and Public Affairs. And he's the author of Ask More, The Power of Questions to Open Doors, Uncover Solutions, and Spark Change. There are a few things I want to go over before we kick things off. First, I'd like to thank our members of the DC Science Writers Association. You help fund events and keep our lights on. Thank you. I want to foster conversation during this webinar. So please, uh, there's two ways to do that. You can ask questions in the Q&A box at the bar at the bottom of your screen. So questions you want to go to Frank, please put them there. You can also post your thoughts on the chat board. Just make sure you select all panelists and attendees. So that's your default setting. And remember that we ask you to adhere to our community guidelines of respect and civility. Uh, lastly, this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel within a few days with captions. So now I wanna tell you a little bit about our expert today. Frank's career spans more than three decades in journalism, including 21 years at CNN, where he served as White House correspondent, anchor, Sunday talk show host, and Washington bureau chief. Before CNN, um, Frank worked as a radio correspondent for the AP, and he has won quite a few awards over his career, including an Emmy, uh, several Cable Ace Awards and an Overseas Press Club Award. Uh, I think Frank will talk a little bit about what he's involved with right now, but I'll just mention that he's the creator of Planet Forward, which is a multimedia storytelling platform um, on sustainability and science. And uh, he also hosts the Planet Forward podcast and the podcast Healthy You Surviving a Pandemic. So. Frank is such a seasoned questioner, and um, we are so thrilled to have him today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Frank. Well, Janessa, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for that gracious introduction. Sometimes I hear that and think, that's not me, is it? Um, <clears throat> but I guess it is, so guilty as charged. And I'm really delighted to be with you all today. And I will kind of put some things out there. And then, uh, Janessa, you'll ask me some questions, and you'll pass them on from, from the rest of the group. First of all, um, I you know, wanna say that uh, I come here um, with a certain amount of humility, but also uh, e really eagerness and enthusiasm. The humility is because all of us who are storytellers are really just vehicles. We're vehicles for the way we tell other people's story. We're not the story, at least not usually. Sometimes we are, it's sort of our journey or whatever. But especially in the area of interviewing, it's fundamentally, you know, what am I listening for, to whom, Toward what end? What am I trying to convey? The book I wrote, oh, I just happened to have one here. What a coincidence, um, was prompted by um, a class I taught. I taught a class called The Art of the Interview. And it, I, I did it when I was thinking of writing the book to see if there was some there there. Was there interest? Was there enough to say? And I have interviewed all my life. Um, I recall doing oral histories when I was in high school. Uh, I was the editor of my high school newspaper. When I went to college, I was at the radio station and I did more of that. I came to Washington to be at the Voice of America and then AP Radio over to London, back to the White House and then CNN and on and on. But everywhere I went, I interviewed. Uh, my very first job, which was a little radio station in Vermont, I'm 21, 22 years old. And there I am interviewing senators. Actually, one of them was still around, Pat Leahy. I interviewed him my freshman year at work and his second year in the United States Senate, the governor of the state. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. But I was also interviewing just people, people who'd lost their jobs, people who'd gotten jobs, people who were doing amazing things. And I was fascinated by it. At CNN, um, some of you may remember, um, it's a while now, a while ago now, for seven years, I did our Sunday talk show. It was then called Late Edition. And I interviewed everybody from presidents and prime ministers to the director of the FBI to scientists and celebrities and other things. So when I taught this class called The Art of the Interview, I was sort of curious, is there a methodology behind it that I could tease out? Um, do people have an instinct for, for good interviewing? 
um, is there enough there? And I actually determined that there was a lot there. And there was a lot that had I thought about it differently when I was doing my daily interviews on CNN, when I was anchoring shows, certainly when I was doing the Sunday talk show, I think they would have been deeper, richer experiences. I really concluded that too often we go into an interview with sort of random thoughts in our head, random questions we want to ask, as opposed to a really clear sense of what do we want out of this? What am I trying to take away from this? So I'm going to share my screen with you now and for a few minutes, and I'll try to rifle through this because there's nothing worse than somebody talking to a PowerPoint, and I hate that, but I'm going to do it anyway, and I'll try not to talk to it, but through it and from it and, and gain maybe a little bit of inspiration along the way. And I'll move quickly through it because what I most want to do is to um, uh, have a conversation with you all and take your questions. So let me pull this up. If I can do this the right way. Mm. Sorry. Okay, can you see that? Janessa, have you got that? Are you seeing my, my, my screen there? Yes. The the interview? Okay. okay, so this is, you know, this, this was my premise, um, that there is a question crisis um, and that we've got, you know, all these amazing things, all this searching we can doing. But as I said, and this was a few years ago now, the polarization of politics amplified by social media has fractured our civil dis civic discourse. And the news media reflecting and reinforcing these trends, that's like where I come from, or some of you may come from, has grown shorter and sharper. I, I, I think sometimes we're too filled with exclamation points and not enough question marks. So the first question is, what is an interview? Um, and, and what are we trying to do? Basically, we're translators. Um, it's a, any conversation where someone's offering information in response to questions on behalf of an unseen audience. You are interviewing, not because you're Seth Meyers, but because you are trying to convey information from someone who's got it, a scientist, an expert, a political leader, a decision maker to some audience, whether it's a general audience or a highly specialized audience. What do you want out of that? This was this is between two ferns. For those of you who know, Hillary Clinton looks like she's having about as much fun here as she actually was having. What are you trying to get out of it? You're creating a higher level of enlightenment. You're trying to generate some real conversation, a human connection, this sense of empathy or, or, or connection. You wanna persuade or challenge or realize or entertain. There are all sorts of different reasons we do an interview. Going into it, asking yourself, why am I here? What am I trying to do? Is it fundamentally to convey information? Is it fundamentally to make an audience laugh? Is it fundamentally to get my subject, who's someone of fasc a fascinating public person to open up? This, this idea of connecting value prop to, to, to outcomes is really important. You can't do an interview. You can't engage another person if you're not really interested in them. I tell this to my students all the time. It sounds so basic and they go, oh yeah, I guess you're right. Um, you gotta know where you're going through the work that you've done to put into it, the questions you ask. What are the answers that you want? What are you listening for? Um, and again, I'm back to outcomes. There are also, there's also this thing called, that I call the dynamics of an interview. And sometimes you can control it, sometimes you can't. Some years ago, I interviewed Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat had come to this country, the head of the PLO. They were at a very contentious moment in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the region. And I asked him a question that he hated. And he stood up and he glared at me and he pointed his finger and I thought he was gonna walk out. And he said, are you calling us animals? Because I had asked him a tough question. And um, I sort of slithered down to fill the space so he couldn't walk out because there was a coffee table between our chairs and, and, the, and the door. Uh, and he sat down and we continued, but I, I, I had thought about a lot of the things in the interview, but not necessarily about the dynamics themselves. What do you want from an interview? All right. Do you want illumination or do you want confrontation? You may remember this one. This is the interview with Chuck Todd, Meet the Press, where Kellyanne Conway suggested there, were such a, such a, there could be such a thing as alternate facts. Uh, Chuck was taken aback, but again, my you know, most fervent desire now as I think back upon the times when I was doing all the interviews of had I sat, sat myself down and said, okay, Frank, what do you want from this? 
and really been clear about it. Uh, it's not that I would have done all sorts of things differently, but I think it would have given me more clarity because these things can veer with the dynamics, as I mentioned, other things. It brings you back. Remember why you're there. Um, I mentioned being driven by outcomes, and this is in some ways how I organized my sort of taxonomy of questions and interviewing for the book. You want information. Do you want explanation or a point of view, an admission or acknowledgement? You know, do you want somebody to re reveal something about themselves or about the world they're in? Um, I put transformation. What does transformation mean? Characters in, in, in stories will undergo transformation. They will change, they will evolve, they will realize. Do you wanna either get that in the conversation itself or do you want that to be something that is an outcome? You want somebody to say, wow, that's a good question. I never thought about that before. So you present them with a dilemma and so that they can re you know, reason out that dilemma um, sort of outwardly and in public perhaps. Resolution, you wanna resolve something. In the case of science, do you wanna, explain something? Do you want to engage a controversy? Science is a different, a little bit different bale of, bale of hay, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, yeah, like listening matters. I have an exercise I do with my students where I'll have two people interview one another, and I'll have the class take notes, and, find, and, the, and the question is, what did that person not follow up on, right? The follow-up question is the big one, and that always comes from listening. I commend people to watch 60-minute interviews. 60 Minutes, which is really a, an interview-based storytelling format, um, has perfected what I call the echo question. So Janessa asks Frank, you know, what's it like to be cooped up in your house since COVID? And I say, well, you know, it's, it's, it's okay, but I'm kind of bouncing off the walls. And, you know, sometimes I have dinner and sometimes I don't. And the echo question would be bouncing off the walls. Take my words, just that, no question, just bouncing off the walls. Oh God, yeah, I can't sleep. I, I lock myself you know, in the bathroom and I don't come out for 12 hours. It almost always prompts someone to explain further, dive deeper. I had a student ask another student what, they, what was their hardest time when they were in school. And this one young woman was saying, gosh, when I was you know, in such and such a grade, I was in a special math class. And when I got up to leave, people watched me and all eyes were on me and I was humiliated. And then she kept talking, the person didn't follow up. So at the end I said, humiliated? She said, oh yes. People looked at me, I felt inferior. She just you know, went deeper and deeper. And that echo question comes from the listening. You listen for words, tone, pauses. You listen for what people say and what they don't say. Um, you listen for missing links. What they don't say is so important, right? At the White House, we would write stories Here's what the president said. What the president didn't say, what do they leave out? You listen with your eyes and you squint with your ears. Body language really matters. Is someone uncomfortable? Is there something to ask about that? Does someone seem really engaged and excited about something? You draw them out more about that. And you look for that listening moment. You're really working on it. I'll tell you a story in a bit from the book when I interviewed Tony Fauci <clears throat> for one of those listening moments. Um, you really listen hard for particular things. Some of these can actually be good for echo questions. Contradictions, people say different things. Admissions or acknowledgements. Um, you know, particulars and details. That really matters in science writing, obviously, in science storytelling. Um, emotion. Emotion is a very big one. Uh, different types of questions, right? So there's the what I call the informational or diagnostic question. That's fundamentally, fundamentally what's going on here, right? You'll recognize this. <laughs> Uh, Captain Sully Sullenberger, right? And you know, when when a plane crashes, when something terrible happens, the first set of questions is, what happened? Where are the people? You go for very urgent, sort of surface level questions, filling in the information gaps. Later, you go for explanation. Later, you go for the what went wrong part. Later, you go for what did you feel, or what did you experience. These are informational and diagnostic questions, right? You're asking like a doctor about the problem, the symptoms, what's wrong, how long it's been going on. You're asking these basic information. These are the building blocks of any interview, the building blocks of any real um, serious questioning, whether it's done by a doctor or a lawyer. First find out what's going on. 
Um, strategic questions. Here I'm interviewing Colin Powell. He's one of the most strategic thinkers I know. What makes a strategic thinker? What makes a strategic question? You're looking over the horizon, all right? Longer range issues. The great questions. A good CEO, right, of a company is thinking 6, 12, 18, 24 months from now. They're thinking strategically. That's what you ask about. Um, and so you can be asking about the alternatives and the risks and the downsides. You're, you're really trying to push someone to respond in a strategic way, all right? If you were interviewing the President of the United States right about now and asking about his healthcare plan, um, which there isn't one, but never mind that, uh, you might be asking, you know, what, where is that going to leave us 24 months from now? How many people will be uh, insured who are not or how much money will be, we be saving that we aren't now? Um, certainly in journalism, there's confrontation and there's accountability. And this is a very important type of question. Uh, and in, in my book, you see each of these areas, diagnostic, strategic, confrontation, empathy, creative, these are all types of questions we can ask to elicit types of responses. So, you know, Anderson Cooper and more recently, uh, Kristen Welker and, and, and um, Leslie Stahl have engaged with this president. I enga have engaged with several presidents. And part of that is holding power to account, confrontational or accountability questions. You're trying to ask about and establish responsibility, complicity. You're, you know, critics accuse people in power all the time of botching something or whatever. And so you're asking about that. So-and-so has accused you of such and such. What is your response or what are you going to do about that? Certainly we hold our people in power up to very strong standards, or we should anyway, of their own hypocrisy. Certainly if they lie, incompetence and wrongdoing. These questions often are not, they are not answered and they often draw very hostile responses. We saw that on 60 Minutes this past week. Trump got up and left, but that's okay, I guess, because bottom bullet here is they are for the record questions, right? If you ask somebody, you know, did you murder someone? They're probably not going to say so, even on the, on the, on, if they go on the stand and they've sworn an oath, they'll take the fifth. But you're asking the question to establish that it is there. And you're either asking the question for the record or the response to the extent you get it for the record. You may know this person, you may not by, by face, but you'd certainly know her by voice. This is Terry Gross. She does uh, the NPR program, West Fresh Air. I interviewed her for the book as I interviewed Colin Powell for the book and Anderson Cooper for my book. And Terry has a very distinct style of interviewing and a very distinct style of digging into someone. She looks for the essence of someone. She particularly likes to interview people who are artists and authors and musicians, and she's looking to kind of find the essence of their creativity. And they're really, um, there's a certain empathic connection that's made. And so she's trying to draw people out. She's really trying to connect with someone's um, creative source or their emotions and fears. Um, and she's a very, very good listener. Um, and because she's such a good listener, it makes her a more um, empathetic person and um, empathic questioner, I think. Um, you know, I wrote the book about questions because kind of like air, we take it for granted. And it's not until you take it apart that you realize just how complex it is. And it's not until you think about it that you realize how much we do it and how often we don't think about it. The question, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, <laughs> you say uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I actually don't think so. I think really um, thoughtful, caring questioning, informed, knowledgeable questioning, um, intense, active listening questioning is the sincerest form of flattery. Because by doing that, you'd say to somebody, I care about you and your career or your science or your contribution or your expertise. You tell someone through your questions and through your interactions that they are important, that you're curious about them, that you're concerned about them. Um, I, one of the many people I interviewed for my book, and I actually talked to several, was a therapist. And therapists establish relationships with their patients based on trust, and the questions that they ask. Um, so I think that um, you know these things we call questions, this thing we call an interview is um, both a bit of an art and a, and a bit of a science. 
And speaking of science, um, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, scientific organizations. I just did an interview yesterday through the uh, Carnegie uh, Institute uh, for Science and uh, with the Kavli Foundation. I work with them. I was interviewing an, uh, an award-winning scientist. Her name is Evina van Dishoek, and she's a Dutch astrophysicist. And she's done remarkable work establishing, or you know, among other things, establishing the presence of ice in um, in deep space and uh, and how they can form on molecules and actually be sticky and uh, help matter stick together. I'm not a scientist, um, but I'm interested in her. And I use my questions and I use my interview to help her evoke her story. Her story of as an origins, how did she get into this work? Um, what has she found remarkable and surprising? What is her work revealed? Um, Janessa mentioned my Planet Forward project. Let me share my screen again and share a few of these things with you. Because uh, I want to do that. Oh dear, let me make this thing go away. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna stop sharing, forget it. I don't wanna get distracted. Uh, I was gonna show you a bunch of pictures, maybe I'll do that later, but I don't wanna hang things up. Um, I started Planet Forward some time ago to connect students from all different backgrounds with the power of storytelling and interviewing um, in science and sustainability. How do we tell a story around data? How do we make data a part of the narrative? How can we use infographics to do that? How do we take a, a scientist or an expert or a policymaker and build a story around that character? Um, how do we use an interview to create a story arc around that person so that we can help that person through the interview tell their story? This is very important in science because as you all know, um, we live in a world now of vast disinformation, of massive um, amounts of media. People are buried by it, inundated. It's a very suspicious, polarized time. Science too much and too often is distrusted. Uh, and answering, and responding to certain questions with data or fact uh, loses when you're going up against emotion and probably fear. So how do we put more narrative into the science that we try to explain? How do we create more character around that? Again, to my students, I boil it down. I really super oversimplify things. I guess maybe it's because I'm a cable TV guy and so I think in sound bites, so shame on me. Um, but I tell people story is pretty simple. The bumper sticker is compelling characters, overcoming obstacles to achieve a worthy outcome. So when you're working with a scientist or trying to tell their story, for example, how do you make them compelling? What makes them interesting? What's gonna make an audience care? Overcoming obstacles. What are they trying to do? Why is that so hard? What has been their setbacks? Where have they been frustrated? Have they ever had to just been tempted with just hanging it up and starting all over again? And to achieve a worthy outcome. What would success mean? What disease might they cure? What discovery might they make? What understanding of the universe might they bring home to the rest of us? Uh, that arc, compelling character, obstacle, and outcome, is something that in kind of a narrative form interview, you, you want to capture or try to capture or try to help your interviewee capture. Couple of final thoughts, and then I want to open it up to your questions and discussion. Um, we've worked with scientists uh, at my, my program a few years ago. We had an executive education program for two and a half days with early to mid-career scientists from across the country and how they can communicate. And they, there are a couple of big challenges that they have, as you well know, communicating um, to a lay public, how to leave the world of science terminology and vernacular behind, how to refer to methodology and data, how to reflect the uncertainty that is at the core of science, um, yet collides with most of the rest of the world. I have yet to 
meet a politician who wants to do an interview and convey uncertainty. They want to be sure they got the answer. They're going to have fight the war on poverty and they're going to win. That's not the way it works, but they don't, they don't want to acknowledge the uncertainty that's such a core part of science. And the idea that, and, and Tony Fauci really personifies this in this whole COVID mess, that we're gonna learn as we go and we're gonna to have to make changes and things may actually be wrong is a very difficult, um, a challenging story to tell um, in a world where everybody wants to be so certain about everything and social media are flying around. So in the interview process, understanding that, providing some um, context for that and pulling it out is super important. I mentioned to you, I would tell you the Tony Fauci story. Um, I interviewed Tony for the book. I first interacted with Tony Fauci in the 1980s when I was a young reporter at the White House during the very earliest days of the HIV AIDS crisis. And Tony was on the front lines of that, as you know. And he was confronted with a very hostile White House then, um, who um, played down the problem. Some called it the gay plague, God's revenge. And there was a day at the White House where um, someone asked a question about the very early um, HIV AIDS problem. And uh, the press secretary at the time made a joke out of it. Uh, so I, when I was interviewing Tony, about this for the book, I asked him about it. I asked him what it was like in those early days treating these young men and watching them die because he just told a story about that. And yet hearing this stuff on the outside. And he started to answer the question and then he broke down and cried and he couldn't speak. And I sat there, I was right next to him and I sat there and I, I thought, okay, I can change the subject. I can say, you know, Tony, it's okay. I, and I didn't, and I didn't because I'd really been thinking about this, about this notion of silence. And I just let the silence hover. And he caught his, he caught himself finally, he caught his breath. And then he, as I say in the book, he erupted. He taught, erupted about what it was like to work with these people, to be in this world, to see people turned out of their apartments, to see this and to see people die and knew there wasn't anything that he could do about it at the time. And what a shit world we lived in, he said, his quote. It provided such incredible insight into his motivation, into his passion, into what he so cared about. And it connects logically with what we've seen of him today. But I almost missed that moment because if I hadn't let that silence breathe, if I said, it's okay, Tony, you know, let's go on to something else. I don't wanna upset you with this. He wouldn't have said that. He wouldn't have erupted in that way. And I wouldn't have gotten, you know, that incredible insight into where he came from. So um, maybe we'll wrap things up now, but I would say, know what you want out of an interview. Prepare intensely for it. Be an incredibly interested, curious um, questioner. Listen deeply. Listen for, when I talk about echo questions, what I tell people to listen for is surprising fact or data points or remarkable and intense emotion. And then follow up on that because that's where you go deeper and, and you learn more. And in the world of science, we got to bring it to life. <laughs> We've got to make it real. Uh, we've got to tell people's stories around them as people. Um, and it's more important now than ever. There's a great hunger for it, but there's also a lot of confusion out there. And then finally, we've got to, you know, put the question marks back in and take the exclamation points back out. We've, we've become, as a culture, bad questioners, impatient questioners, and distracted listeners. And if we're going to build the bridges that have been shattered, across the technology that's helped blow them up. Um, some of these uh, traits, I think, uh, are gonna have to be rediscovered and reapplied in new and different ways, but there are that fundamental human component um, that still matters. So with that, I would thank you and I'll take your questions. Janessa, I'm back to you and I hope that addresses some of what you're interested in.
Thank you, Frank. That was fantastic. Uh, really fascinating. Uh, and I've been so happy to see the questions coming in on the Q&A. So I'm just going to jump into those. Um, I want to uh, start with one here that connects with your really powerful story about Fauci and that interview with him. And, you know, so this is a question from um, Ilya Ben Ari. Um, and they ask, scientists are often leery of being part of the story. They like to stick to discussing about their work and they're reluctant to talk about themselves. So do you have any advice on how to get around that? Well, some of that's going to have to come from the scientists themselves. I mean, and one of the reasons we did this executive education program was to tell them that. <laughs> You're going to have to be a little comfortable being a character in your own story and, and allowing yourself to, to, to have a little bit of what some would say might see as ego or some in the academic community, they don't want to do this because it's peer reviewed scientific journals. That's the only place you should be. Um, I disagree. That's not the kind of world we live in anymore. Um, I think the, to your, to the question though, it, it's, it's really an issue of what are you interviewing for? What do you want that scientist for? And how are you trying to explain the, the function to them? So we might be interviewing somebody because they're an expert in, I'm going to make, say here because I'm interested in climate change and they've discovered something new and we want to learn more about their discovery. We might want to interview them because there's some big new contentious issue around climate change and their expertise could bring some perspective to the story. Um, we might want to interview them because we just want a more detailed explanation. You've got a school board meeting or you've got a town council meeting and they would like the local scientist to come in and just please to explain why are we getting all this flooding here in Miami when the sun is shining these days. So you're not either weighing in on a controversy, you're not weighing in on a, on a immediate piece of your work, but you're there for your general expertise. Explaining to that person why they should be part of that conversation, how they can share their expertise, even if they're not published yet in, in the journal, um, is part of the process. But a lot of the burden is also going to fall onto the scientific community too, because, and, and, and it is increasingly, they're increasingly being engaged in this conversation. I'm on the board of an organization you may have heard of called the National Council for Science and the Environment. And we're engaging scientists all the time on how not to be advocates, but how to be advocating for science. Um, sometimes the line gets crossed there and that's gonna be up to each person. It's actually a very tricky question in the scientific community now as to how, how far on the, on, the, on the scale of advocacy someone should go. And, and everybody is gonna answer that question differently. Last point on this, probably can't talk someone into being an interview subject and engaging in, in, in popular media if they really are uncomfortable and don't want to do it. You can try and we can explain these things. I think most people get it now because they see the world around them, but there are still a, there, there are a lot of bridges to cross yet in this. Great, great, great. And this is another question about scientists. So many of us spend so much of our time with them. Do you have any tips for interviewing people who are speaking too technically? Yes, I actually have an assignment I give my students called interview a scientist and translate them. Um, and um, it's actually quite helpful. Sometimes it's a little embarrassing. We, we prearrange this with the scientists so they go along for the ride. Because, and I, I relate to this because as I say, I'm not a scientist. But my job as a journalist is to help you explain yourself. So I've got to be smart enough to know what to ask, smart enough to know how to translate that into a story but um, I generally come back on it a second time. Um, and I'll say, well, Janessa, can you explain, what, what exactly does one part per billion mean? Um, or um, sometimes, you know, again, if it's live and in front of a camera, an audience, I might say, as I might have to, to oh, I didn't last night, but I could have, I might say, you know, Madam Scientist, if I got on the phone to my aunt Tilly, who doesn't know anything about what you do, how would I how would I translate that? So I can ask the I'm the dumb reporter question in a variety of different ways. Sometimes, especially if it's for television and we're rolling and we're you know we're going to use it as a we're going to use it as literally as a soundbite. I might come back on the question. Could, Jeanette, could I ask you to uh, could I ask that question 
to you again. And, and, and maybe since a lot of the audience will be hearing this is not familiar with the jargon, um, ask you to try that again and, 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 and explain it to, you know, frankly, a lay audience. And sometimes that helps too. Um, explaining going in who the audience is going to be is probably the most effective. If I could ask you, I'm gonna, you know, let's, I'm, gonna, I'm fascinated to do this interview with you, but just let me tell you, my audience is, is X. So as you answer, if you could keep that in mind, that'd be very helpful. So you can kind of prompt people a little bit. That's great, saying it right up front, uh, and then you can keep touching on it throughout. Right. Yeah, and so uh, something I was wondering about reading your book is, some journalists um, face barriers in conducting interviews based on, say, their gender or their race. So I wanted to know, how have you broken down barriers that you've faced during interviews? I love that question. I, Planet Forward, and in fact, I would invite anybody here, uh, this Planet Forward project I started, we generally ha have a summit every year and we bring together communicators and storytellers and scientists and students and others, and we talk about this. Well, we couldn't do it in person this last year. So we're doing a series of virtual summits and tomorrow is one of them. And if you go to planetforward.org, I'll put in a little plug, you'll see Summit 2020 and you can click on that and join it. And we've done three one hour summits, uh, summit series over the past three weeks. This will be the third one. Our focus this season for a variety of reasons that should be obvious have been environmental equity, inclusion and institutional change and the narratives around them to propel that change. And um, I spoke last week with a woman by the name of Shirley Cojado. She's from the Dominican Republic, first in her family to go to college in this country. She was a Posse scholar. If any of you have heard about the Posse Foundation, it's a college access program. She's the first Posse scholar to become a college president and she's president of Ithaca College. We got into a fascinating conversation of who can tell my story to that question. Can you tell that story? If I'm a gay male, can, who can tell my story? If I'm a black woman, who can tell my story? If I'm from the Dominican Republic, who can tell my story? I'm the first in my family. And she said, I don't think anybody can tell my story. And I said to her, well, wait a minute. What if I, as a storyteller, see myself more as, less as your spokesperson, mm -hmm. translating your story, and more as a vehicle for you to tell your story? So I think the, the answer to that question, Janessa, is that. Can we be vehicles? Can we be vehicles for others? That means giving others more time, more running room within their own story, perhaps. It's tricky, it's hard, but uh, I very much think it can be done. I think it requires a deep, uh, a big dollop of empathy because you have to under, you have to be in the shoes of that person whose story you're telling. And that may be very hard if you've never shared their fundamental experience. Right, right, absolutely. And that was something um, interesting about the book is that you don't just talk to journalists about questions. You talk to a nurse in Appalachia, you talk to therapists, interrogators, your neighbor who fixes roofs, right? So um, can you tell us like, what can we learn from other professions about how to ask questions? They do it for a living and they do it with purpose. My neighbor, Al, who's the roofer, who you pointed out, who I adore. And, and it's like, if your roof is leaking and you call the roofer, what do you want? You want your roof to stop leaking. What does he want? He needs to figure out where the leak is so he can fix it. So he's going to ask you a whole series of questions. Where does it leak? Does it leak when, it, when it's raining? Does it leak when the wind blows? I mean, he told me that he actually asked that question. And I said, what's that all about? He said, because often the wind will blow and it will crosswise and it will blow up against a window and the leak is actually in the, in the caulking around the window. Um, you think about the questions that a lawyer asks or cross and cross examination. They're very specific. Janessa, I have something, I have an article that you wrote on February 3rd, 2018. You wrote research aimed at determination of the structure of cosmic objects using their molecular, molecular spectra. Did, did, is, are those your words? Yes, they are. Did you mean them when you wrote them? Yes, I did. Well, do you mean them now? Well, no, actually on, on, on April 3rd, you said, were you lying then? All right. So 
the, the art of question asking is very much dependent upon these different fields. And we can learn so much as journalists and as questioners by looking at how other people ask. Again, it's outcome driven. Right. And, you know, I want to um, ask one about one person specifically that you talk to, and then I'll get back to audience questions. But so one of the part of the books that I found really fascinating was when you talk with a professional interrogator. So this guy, Barry Spodek, um, he trains agents in the FBI and Secret Service, right? So Barry adheres to a theory of two systems of the human brain. So could you provide more information about what these systems are and how you've used that in your interviewing? So he's, he, Barry is, you know, knows and is a follower of Dan Kahneman, who talks about these, these kind of uh, our, our systems and red flags and green flags. And when we're on alert and, you know, it, it changes the way we are. He's, and he also takes, he, he really takes a page from hostage negotiators and all the rest. And what they're trying to do is lower the stress, lower, you know, Kahneman's red flags, put people at ease so they talk doesn't matter what they talk about. If people talk, that establishes a rapport, that establishes a relationship. So people will open up. What do you want a hostage taker to do? You want them to release the hostages, but you actually have to gain their trust a little bit, even though you know you're in a life and death struggle. And by the way, the thing about Barry that was so amazing to me among many things um, is he was, you know, for those of you who've been around and know, he was John Hinckley's therapist, group therapist. When John Hinckley was at St. E's, John Hinckley, of course, being the man who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan. And Barry was a young graduate student and then went into the, into the field from there. But his, what he, he's in, in the field of dangerous threat assessment. So, Janessa, if you write a letter that says, you know, the president's the Antichrist and should die, da 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 da, are you just angry? Are you mentally unstable? Or are you actually dangerous? Might you actually pull that trigger? And that's what Barry trains these other people to interrogate, to question people, to find out. And it might be saying, um, uh, well, the way Barry puts it is, you know, you wrote this letter and you say the presence of the Antichrist. Um, you know, a lot of people feel that way. T tell me about that. He doesn't say, oh, by the way, are you planning to kill the president? <laughs> you know, because you're going to go like this. I, I wrote, I, when, I, when, I, when I was writing the book, when I saw that, I thought, I thought of naming the chapter of terrorists and teenagers because I thought engaging your teenager could be similar. But if somebody has deep distrust, antipathy, hostility, gaining their trust, speaking to them, posing a question without asking a question, I call it question without question marks. So you're not putting someone, you know, you're not rocking them back, you're trying to get them to respond. Great, great. And so I want to go into kind of a, a rapid fire question answer for the audience. Uh, so is there such a thing as a stupid question? Yes, a stupid question. You know, we say no, but yes, a stupid question is deliberately, uh, deliberately um, malevolent. A stupid question is where you have had opportunities to prepare and you've chosen not to prepare. A stupid question wastes people's time. I mean, I fundamentally feel that People should ask whatever they want, but there are things as stupid questions and I've asked my share of them too. <laughs> how do you rescue an interview, interview when it starts going south? Depends how south it's going and how fast. Sometimes you can't. Uh, you bring it back, you try, it depends who it's with. If it's with a politician, that's one thing. If it's with a celebrity, it's another. If it's with a scientist or a sports figure, it's another. It depends what the cause of going south is. So, you know, there, there was nothing that, that Leslie Stahl could have done the other night to rescue the interview with Trump when it was going south, because he was clearly displeased from the first moment he sat down. And he's antagonistic to begin with and makes no bones about that. Humor works, but it's why we start interviews typically with icebreakers. Uh, when I was at CNN for years and years, Larry King would dro drove us all crazy because Larry King got these great interviews. He asked everybody softball questions, we thought. But Larry got people to, to talk. An icebreaker question is a softball. It's an open-ended question where you might say, you know, well, tell me about the most exciting thing that's happened in the last week, or what are you proudest of, or something like that. But it puts people at ease. Um, if it really goes south, it's, it's hard to rescue. There have been a couple of repeat questions in the Q&A um, around 
Um, basically, the questions that you always ask in an interview, no matter who the person or what the subject, what are those? Uh, well, again, it depends on what the interview is and where you are, all right? But the typical who, what, when, where, why, how questions, you know, have to be asked in some form or another. Um, it also depends on who the audience is. So, for example, when I was interviewing the scientist last night, I mean, uh, this week, um, the audience was pulled together by Carnegie and Cavley. So these were all science-interested people, but they weren't scientists. So we couldn't go, you know, this was not the interview that I would have done if we were to, you know, astrophysicists, you know, convention or a cosmology convention or something like that or gathering. Um, but it was, but there were questions that were for the, for the science fascinated. Um, so I think, you know, knowing who the audience is, knowing what you're, you know, um, what you're, what you're after and what your expertise is, is the key there. Gotcha. Gotcha. And this, this question is about, um, how did it make you feel questions? So uh, a questioner asks, I dislike these questions, whether aimed at the mother of a tragically killed son or the um, uh, pitch hitter who drove the winning run. They seem to intended to make the interviewer seem empathetic, but really we already know how they feel, don't, don't, don't we? What is your take? Depends on who, what, when, you know, um, I've interviewed people who had, you know, tragic loss and you kind of think, why would you even do this? You know, why, why, there's a, um, I mean, and there's been some research on this, but there is sort of a cathartic nature for some people and they, and they may want to remember their tragically killed child, whether it's a, a you know, a child who was killed in some horrible school shooting or whatever else, and this is a way to honor their memory. Um, these are really, really, really hard questions. And, and, and um, I had to go out after the Virginia Tech shooting and knock on doors. And I was praying that no one would answer any of the doors that I was knocking on. Unfortunately, they didn't, because I, didn't just, I just didn't want to be there. Um, but if someone had, I would, have been, I would have said who I was, I would have offered my condolences, and I would have asked them to start with, are you interested in speaking about this? And if they had said no, that would have been the end of it. If they said yes, I would have asked them you know, how they, what do they want to say and to whom? And, and, and how do they want to remember whomever they've lost? The, 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 the other example given is of the picture, right? And I covered when I was in London, I covered Wimbledon, which was really cool. I haven't, I'm not a sports reporter, so I haven't done that much. But going in and going into the, into the um, interview room when the athletes come through, and they're required contractually to, do there, to, to be there. So they want to be there about as much as you do in the dentist chair for the, you know, for the root canal. They, they, they're not wow, I can't wait to talk to the reporters. That's not why they're there. And these questions about like, how did you feel when this and that, I agree, they feel like, really? So uh, if I ask some of variant of that, I try to not just ask it like that, but dress it up somehow. But I haven't got a good answer for you. You know, reading your book, I was wondering, um, how do you know what your strengths are as an interview? interviewer and can you like design your interviews to play to your strengths great question uh so if you really want to torture yourself do a couple of interviews and just record them and then listen to them and i i've done that and frequently i listen to myself and say would you just shut up and ask the question typically we're our own toughest critics and um I think the best way to do it is, is, is just to do that. I did an, an exercise a few years ago where I took the transcripts of people, of interviewers, the written transcripts, and I pulled out, I erased all the answers. And I just looked at the questions. Do that to yourself, transcribe an interview and do it to yourself. And you'll say, man, I am really articulate. I could, I could talk really well or, God, I mangled that sentence. That was pretty, how did they even answer it? Because I don't even know what I just asked. Um, what I, you know, again, too, it depends on what the format for your interview is. If I'm live in front of an audience, if I'm doing something from, for just pencil and paper, electronically speaking, uh, if I'm doing something for my own background, um, 
drives a little bit how I'm performing because there's a performative part of this too, both right. for yourself, for the person you're interviewing, and certainly for your audience. Right, right. And along those lines, um, you know, one person asked, most of us, likely, none of us actually, will be moderating a presidential debate anytime soon, but it certainly put live fact checking into the spotlight. How can journalists fact check while an interview is live? Can, like, really hard, really yeah. hard, really subjective. Oh, by the way, I can, if I can do another plug. Yeah, go for it. We have, we have not announced this yet. So you're hearing this first. Please Ooh. don't tweet it, but we'll be doing a, I'll be doing an interview. I'll be doing a, an event with the moderators of the presidential debates um, in a few weeks and um, engaging them on this very thing. How did the debates work? What did we learn from them? What do they really reveal? And what's the future of this format? Um, so if you keep an, if you, you know, we can stay in touch and I'll, I'll get that to everybody. But um, I, I think that fact checking is very perilous to try to do that in real time, but it can be done. And I think um, if you look at what, at the way Chris Wallace uh, interviewed uh, Don, Donald Trump when he did him for Fox News uh, Sunday, uh, John Swan did something similar. Um, you come, it's a bit like the, it again, it depends what the interview is going to be. Do you know that it's going to be an accountability interview? Do you know that you're dealing with somebody um, and the purpose, the purpose is to highlight inconsistencies or misinformation or under delivery? That's going to be totally different than the interview I did last night with a scientist. I wasn't, I wasn't there to confront her. I was there to draw her out. Um, so if you know that you're going into an interview like this, then you have to be armed with certain facts that you know you own. All right, I'm going to know the background on where are the COVID cases, what are the numbers, how do we compare to the rest of the world? I'm not going to try to be an expert, but this is what I'm good at. This is what the lawyer does, right? This is the cross-examination. But you can't fact check everything in real time. That's not there's certain things that you're going to be good at, certain things you're going to know well enough, but if it's a broad, I mean, a wide ranging interview, it's going to be impossible. Right, right, right. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that event. It sounds awesome. Um, and so fun question from Catherine in the audience. What's the biggest scoop you unearthed in one of your interviews? Were you looking for that particular answer to your question or did it come as a surprise? The most surprising thing, and this will this will this will date me, but it was it, there were there are several. I mean, there are several. I I, uh, I was interviewing Margaret Thatcher one time, <laughs> and uh, Thatcher was Th Thatcher was was tougher than Trump on the media. I mean, really, but she did it with that, you know. And she said, "That's a very stupid question. Only a stupid man would ask ask such a stupid question." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the most surprising thing to me came years ago. I'll, I'll, I'll reveal my, my, my time. Uh, no, there have been several, but uh, I was interviewing Dr. C. Everett Koop, who was the Surgeon General during the Reagan and Bush years. Uh, and he was Surgeon General when HIV AIDS exploded on the scene. And he started, and, he, and I had him on the Sunday show, and he started talking about um, safe sex and condom use. I had never heard this on the air. This had never been spoken about on the air. We were approaching a public health crisis and he took that on. And I thought that was incredible because first of all, he was breaking all sorts of barriers. And secondly, he was displaying real courage. Um, I did an interview with Palestinians and Israelis together um, where you know they were first and, and there was some real you know, uh, distance covered there. More recently, I, I, I wouldn't say it was a surprise, but I was, inter I was interviewing Nancy Pelosi at, at, at GW. And, you know, she started talking a bit about the, you know, their strategy toward dealing with, with the Donald Trump. So, you know, it, it again, it depends on, on, on the person and, and, and the area and the moment in time. But, there, you know, there have been some moments. Great, great. Um, and so I'm trying to look at the time and how many more I'm so thank you for all of these questions. Everyone is fantastic. Um, we're having some getting some questions about the difference of interviewing in broadcast first 
you know, radio versus print. Um, can you speak to that? How you big can your interviews differently? Yeah, big difference. I'm out of radio. I come from radio first. Some of you probably heard of the Diane Reem show, or you may have heard the Diane Reem show years ago on, on NPR. And I had the great, great fortune of sitting in for Diane a lot. Best, best, best interview format without question of any place I've been. Cameras, and I interviewed for a million, a million times on CNN, well, maybe not a million, you know, alternate facts, uh, a bunch of times on CNN. Cameras do weird things. Cameras make people feel very self-conscious. They get you know, they, they, they clam up. Um, it's why documentary interviewers will spend hours and hours, days and days, weeks and months with their subjects to make them comfortable in front of a camera so they open up. People open right up in front of a microphone and radio. It's astounding. It really is wonderful. And to spend an hour with an author. You know, I interviewed Jane Goodall one time and I had a whole hour to talk to her. She could actually complete a thought. I mean, imagine that. Uh, there you're drawing someone out. And in a, in a format like that, you can take a thought and you can really spend time on it. You can really go down into it. When I was interviewing on CNN, we'd have six to eight minutes. You can't do much and you got it. That's, that's right to the news. What do you say about this? So-and-so said that, what's your response? The questions are shorter, the answers are shorter. Um, interviews that I've done, and I've been doing them recently, for example, for a column I hope to write soon, um, those are different because you're, maybe on the phone or you're maybe now via text or email, you're doing something else. They're more transactional in nature. So the questions will be very much more, there will be narrower questions, more specific. The interview I did last night with Avina was for a live audience like this. And she and I had talked uh, several times, part of preparation about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to engage the audience. And so that was more of a, I'd say more of a conversation that we had tried to put together rather than an interview, question, answer, question, answer. So, um, you know, it depends too on how much time you've got. An hour on the Diane Reem show is totally, totally different experience than a quick hit for an article, you know, that you're trying to turn or for um, a cable interview where you've got commercials every 37 seconds. Right, right. And now we have Zoom interviews, a whole new- Now we have Zoom interviews, which is, yeah. which is really cool. I mean, I this, I'm in front of two lights here and my laptop. And, you know, once upon a time, in my recollection, this would have taken two, three, four, five people in a gigantic satellite truck. And now you can, you know, come from your bookshelf. Right, right. Totally, totally new world. And so I want to end with. Uh, I have two more questions. I know we're at uh, eight, so those that have to head out, that's all right. But two more quick questions. One, okay, in your opinion, best interviews at, of the, who are the best interviewers at CNN um, right now and the late night comic hosts? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mangle that question because I'm going to take part of it and then take the, another part in the other direction. But I think uh, terrific. Jake Tapper is a great interviewer. Right to the point. He's very informed. He's tough. Um, and I, and I think uh, Anderson Cooper is a terrific interviewer. Anderson, I talked to him about his interviewing style and especially when he's out of the studio and in the field, which nobody can be now because of COVID. Who are the other best interviewers? I'm going to tell you that one of the best interviewers out there right now at forever is Howard Stern. Howard Stern is an unbelievable interview, interviewer. He will ask you anything. He listens like crazy. He's very curious. He's very engaged and he gets people to talk about unbelievable things. Wow. <laughs> Great, great. And um, the last thing is, I mean, what hasn't come up yet that you want to touch on? Wow. Um, well, that, that's a good, in a good, good form of an interview, always you end with, if I, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you'd like to talk about? Uh, you had asked me earlier, if you could ask me about my father, um, and you haven't done that. So I'll, do you want to ask or shall I just set it up? Um, go for it. The floor is yours. So my father passed away uh, just this past Friday. And Janessa, when we were talking, said, may I ask you about that? And I said, of course you may. I have a chapter in the book on, of something that I call legacy questions. I've done a lot of work with the Hospice Foundation of America over the years and issues of end of life. And what struck me when I was talking to people from hospice over the years is they often will engage the patients and their families through the questions they ask them. They don't tell them things, they ask them things. And I was talking with a spiritual care advisor at hospice some years ago, and he talked about the questions that people ask him when they're confronting the end of their lives. Is there a God? 
what will be on the other side? What happens when I'm buried? What if there's no God? What has my life meant? A pretty big questions. So I thought about that and I thought, and it led to the chapter in the book called Legacy Questions. Uh, because I think they're incredibly important questions and not just questions we should ask at the end of our lives, but they are questions we should ask ourselves, not every day, because that would be a little intense, but a lot as we go along. Why, are, why do we do what we're doing? What matters to us? What have we contributed? Who have we touched? What have we helped? What is our story? What's my story? My father lived two months shy of his 95th birthday. Um, I have here something that he wanted to give me. He told me all his life. This is his gold Rolex watch. He yeah. bought this when he was 20 years old. When he was 19 years old, he had been wounded in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was hospitalized for a Good long period of time and then when he got out they made him an mp i think he had some weird duty like keeping the, the soldiers out of brothels or something weird like that <laughs> uh but he was on leave and he took himself to switzerland and he bought this watch and on the back his, his name was frank as well so i'm named frank as well so on the back here it says fs san moritz 310 1946 he was 20 years old and um, Janessa asked me if there was, you know, anything I would have asked my dad or something like that. Well, I actually did an oral history with my father, a series of recordings a few years ago. I set up a camera and I just sat and I asked him to reflect and recollect. We did it in five or six different sort of 10 to 20 minute installments. And I now have that. So I asked him those questions and I now have his answers forever. And his, my children and my grandchildren and whoever else will have that. And I'm really glad I did. I'm sure there were other things, but asking the questions while you can, capturing those answers forever, learning from them, I think would be the gift that I got and what I would pass on, Janessa, in response to your question. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's that's really special that you had that time and you have that immoral, you know, immoralized in this film. Um, that's wonderful. Um, and I just want to thank everyone so much because this has been such an excellent conversation. Um, you know, thank you all for staying on with us here uh, and for asking such thoughtful questions. Um, of course, thank you, Frank, for sharing your expertise and knowledge and stories. Um, we'd love to hear about your upcoming events. So we will communicate that with our listserv or you can check our website. Um, and I want to thank the members of the DC Science Writers Association who please, made... jo please, please join us at the Planet Forward Summit tomorrow. We'll start at 1230. Go to planetforward.org. I'd love to hear back from you. Any suggestions, ideas, thoughts you've got. Um, we really are trying to connect young people and sort of sustainability and science communication mm -hmm. and kind of make a movement out of it. So we'd love to would love to continue the conversation with you all. That's fantastic. We cannot wait to, to join. Um, and so I just want to end with uh, an announcement that, of course, the DC Science Writers Association, we're always looking for more volunteers. Uh, so you can reach out to our president at president at duxwa.org if you want to get involved. Um, and this is everything from us tonight. So again, thank you so much uh, to you, Frank. And um, I hope we can see you all again soon. Um, and good night, everybody. And remember to ask questions. Okay. Thank you, Frank. You Thank take you. care. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>